Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you the, for uh, the Munich uh, Kotlin Mira for inviting me. And also, we are taking advantage of this opportunity uh, to speak about a similar concept I spoke at Microsphere uh, last week could, that uh, unfortunately couldn't be properly recorded. So this video, I hope it serves uh, to clarify some of those uh, concepts as well. What we're going to be talking today about is about type proofs or uh, propositions as types and proofs as programs. And these are essentially a way in which we can encode uh, new powerful features in the Kotlin type system using the basic principles upon which functional programming is built on. So my name is uh, Raul, and as Enrique mentioned, I worked at 47 degrees, and I've been working in the last couple of years in the Kotlin compiler and working in the maintenance of the Aero library, which is a library for functional programming in Kotlin, as well as uh, Aero Meta. And the features you're going to be seeing here today, they're not only going to be available as compiler plugins for you to use after Kotlin 1.4, but they will also be available as keeps uh, to the language in case there's any interest in adopting on any of these in mainstream coding. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to learn about is that propositions can be seen uh, as types. There's a direct relationship between uh, combinatory logic and set theory or the theory of uh, types. And we can see here uh, this relationship in which in logic, if we have both A and E, sorry, both A and B, uh, that implies we have B and A. And this could be easily encoded uh, in any language that has tuples or uh, functions with two arguments uh, by proving this type of relationship. This is telling us something important. There is a direct relationship between logic and implication and that that we encode in computers programs. So, the other part of uh, this notion is that proofs are programs. And we can uh, obviously see here that for the example that we were seeing before, uh, we can potentially just write a Kotlin function that will satisfy this uh, uh, condition. And now we see here the direct relationship between what we write in a programming language and the Boolean logic implications that some of those statements has in terms of the types and how they uh, relate with each other. So everything I'm telling you is something called the curry hower correspondence, which has a third part, which is uh, the Lambex uh, correspondence. And this correspondence is basically nothing but saying that there is a direct relationship between logic or set theory and also category theory. We see here in this uh, diagram the same notion as we saw before in logic and we saw in a potential encoding of a program. Uh, we see here uh, in terms of category theory. If we notice there is A, B, uh, and we can call those objects, those objects represent types in the category of the Kotlin type system, and they have arrow drawn uh, from them that show the same relationships we are seeing above. If we have both A and B, we can obtain B or A, um, but we can also obtain B and A. So this uh, might sound a little cryptic, but it's going to make uh, a lot of sense pretty soon once we get to the most uh, important part, which is implication. So there is uh, some of these rules that we are uh, seeing. Uh, they manifest themselves in many parts of the language. For example, the one we said that A and B, uh, we can see that encoding in a language like Kotlin as a data class for a tuple or a pair. We can see the one for the introduction that if we have A and B, therefore we have A and B as an implication, that is our constructor. And then by elimination, each one of the fields that will access uh, these values in the type system. So we yet see more uh, the uh, relationships between what people are using in logic and people are using in other parts of uh, type and set uh, theory uh, in what we actually encode 
in our languages uh, such as Kotlin. But the most important one of them all is that in Kotlin, subtyping can be seen as an implication. If you notice in the diagram uh, above, you can see what we will look like a standard uh, subtype Kotlin uh, hierarchy or that of any other language like Java or perhaps uh, Scala that supports subtyping. So we have on the top a number, and then we have other subtypes of that number. But here comes the challenge. Some of these types cannot be extended because they are final, they are sealed, like in this case, int. This relationship of positive int and negative int will never be possible because int is a sealed type that is either in the standard library or in the JDK. And these types are final, uh, but they cannot be extended. So while subtyping is the same as implication in logic in terms of Kotlin, we know by the curry Howard correspondence that this rule of implication is not that of per se that it has to be through a subtype relationship, but also that a function can bridge that gap. That is, if we have a function that takes us from positive end to end, we can potentially ad hoc enhance these types to give them new meanings. And this is what we're gonna see today with these uh, demonstrations. In this example with code, we can see here uh, that there is a, you know, a third party model for an account, uh, has an abstract interface uh, called combine. And this abstract interface will be expressed basically what in functional programming people call monoid, in which it has a, an empty value or an entity empty value. And also it has an association like plus to combine. And then we can prove the account can actually implement the combination through an external uh, proof or interface or class, which is not actually extending uh, directly combined. In this case, we can also prove that the account can acquire the behaviors of combined account and the behavior of the constructors of the interface account. And we see here that it's failing because there's no real proof that those functions are as such. The new type proof system, as you see here, extends, uh, we can use the extension annotation to project all of the members of combine directly over account. And now those members become available immediately over syntax over any of the types. This allows us to replace subtype relationships by composition where needed uh, providing a proof, you can go from one type uh, to another. And this system collaborates with the Kotlin type checker as a compiler uh, plugin to pretty much give you what you're seeing here. It's a more powerful ability than type classes themselves, but it's the notion of drawing any arbitrary arrows from any two types to project extension behaviors from one type to another. The next feature we're going to be uh, looking into, it's going to be union types. So union types, uh, we can think of them as uh, the potential choice of a value of either two types. In this case, we are choosing either an in or a character. So we can see when we create a union that the actual inhabitants of this uh, potential expression might contain all the range of values that characters have, as well as all the range of values that integers uh, may have. So what does it look like, for example, in code? Here, we are gonna say we have a similar example, response with success and failure, which models the typical case of an ADT. Uh, and we are having a union to type. And as you can see, the union can coerce uh, the type on or the value on the right directly without using the constructors implicitly. This is because we have provided yet proofs that any value in a polymorphic context like A, in this case is success, can go to the first position of a union given there is a proof that you saw expanded before when we were seeing first and second in the animation. Another property of union types 
is that union types are commutative. What that means is that union types uh, doesn't matter how you combine them, uh, whether it's left to right or right to left, if you have a union or of an int uh, or characters, uh, and if you have a union of characters or ints, it ends up being the same. Because once uh, the number, as we can see in this diagram, the number of inhabitants is gonna be all of the ones from both int and character. This means uh, that unions are not the same as the data type either, as many people get confused sometimes uh, with. Unions are, don't have a bias, so they treat all of their positions equally. Additionally, unions are associative. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have uh, a union that uh, appends first uh, with another union that is of a different type, and then those two unions merge into a bigger one in different order. As we can see here again, they still preserve um, the property that all of the inhabitant values within the union are all the possible range of values. So doesn't, nesting doesn't really uh, apply as much since here we are having basically in character or Boolean in both cases. So here is a quick example, oops, yes. The other property before we go to the example is the unions have a neutral uh, element. So this in Kotlin will mean that unions uh, will, uh, in a way, if you have an int or nothing, that implies you just have int and that is also true when you combine unions uh, of different types. For example, in this case, we're going to see in the demo, we have here uh, two cases of success for the union, and we see that union two of two successes is the same uh, as just uh, success. We can replace the value for success. Uh, we see here part of the ID integration in which the union is collapsed. And this pointless value, again, if he was uh, pointed to one of the upper bounds, which in this case is either success or response, it automatically coerces respecting the subtype uh, semantics of the Kotlin language. Uh, if there is any questions, feel free to shoot them over the chat. I'm looking at uh, YouTube and other places, so uh, I'll be happy to answer while I'm going through some of these features or after the talk. The next feature we're going to look at is uh, type refinements. Uh, something we built uh, for type refinements is uh, the ability to further constrain a type, not just by its base primitive type, but Boolean conditions that will allow you to get a more precise uh, type when you are attempting to do domain modeling, such as representing positive ints and types that usually languages uh, don't, don't cover. Uh, there is, uh, in this case here, in this uh, animation, we see what well, we're constraining the int type, and we are constraining it by two predicates. The first one, it says that int has to be greater or equal to zero, and the second, that it has to be uh, even. So at that point, we are uh, selecting a really precise uh, type. Uh, there is a question I'm going to answer before I move forward. Marvin is asking on YouTube, can we use these great features already? On when are they planned for release? So these features are currently available as a, a snapshot form in Aero Meta, but they will be available for release once the Kotlin 1.4 backend becomes uh, stable and IR becomes the, the default backend system for the Kotlin compiler. So these features rely on Kotlin IR as well as Jetpack Compose does and many other uh, frameworks. So we're waiting for that to become stable to do the first uh, stable release following the Kotlin compiler lifecycle. Then you will be able to use them uh, as a stable. For the moment, you can use them if you want in a snapshot by depending on Kotlin 1372, which is the latest supported version of Meta because of this issue with IR that I mentioned. 
There's another question for Mario. Is it correct that a union type can replace option either? If so, how would you unwrap the value? The typical when value sum, nothing, none, something. Okay. So the question is, does union types replace option or either? They do not. I mean, uh, nullable types replace option because option is a nonsense constructing Kotlin given Kotlin has nullable type uh, native support with a faster runtime, but not a union types. If union types were introduced in Kotlin, they wouldn't be introduced potentially in the type system hierarchy, which implies that a nullable is the same as a or null. So union sits on top of that uh, hierarchy, but at the moment, this uh, technology we developed for Aerometa doesn't require that that happens. We use inline classes uh, instead. So they don't replace either either because uh, uh, either is a, a right bias data type. That means it's mean for you to use things like flat map and the kind of uh, <clears throat> the kind of functions that allow you to compute monadically over structures. And either per se being biased uh, is capable of doing so, but a union is not biased. Uh, you can make a bias if you have some extension functions, but it will be up to you to decide what the bias side is. Is it the first, the second, the third, or the 22nd argument, since there is up to union 20? There's another question. What is the relation of refined types to dependent types? Is It is the same thing. There is a direct relationship between uh, refined types to dependent types in languages such as Haskell uh, and uh, Scala which use the type system and path dependence to model type refinements and to accumulate uh, basically type information in type signatures. And that's a way of refining types for sure that is successful and many people use in those languages. In the case of Kotlin, that doesn't make uh, much sense because Kotlin lacks uh, path dependent types. So in our case, what we do is we refine expressions that we can evaluate as constants at compile uh, time and also we introduce a specific data flow analysis that perform logical analysis over the data flow and allows for a, a system of kind of liquid Haskell style at the expression level, not just as the at the type level. So it's a different approach, but they both serve uh, the same purpose, and this could have been accomplished with path dependent types if Kotlin had it. I hope that answers uh, the questions. <clears throat> so now that we've seen this refined type example, let's uh, uh, take a, a quick look into how, what does it mean when we are refining a type? So see, if we're refining a type like this one and, and our expression says it has to be bigger or equal than zero, we can observe that the input here, if valid, it will be uh, going through just fine and then the data flow analysis will know from here on that this body is an integer that is bigger or equal uh, to zero, therefore making it safe for other expressions that act on positive uh, integers uh, to be safe without actually having to wrap or check further in the path. So how does it look like? Uh, let's take a quick look. In this example, this is a different domain and model. We are modeling calls to a remote API where we have some things. We have a key, and the key has some constraints. It has to be of uh, size 56, and it has to be alphanumeric. So we can see here that we can use the refinement annotation over an inline class, and then we can specify each one of the predicates using the standard library, and that's the biggest difference with the type level approach that it was asked before. Here we're using the standard library APIs to actually refine our types. And we are able to evaluate these expressions as long as they're pure uh, within the compiler context in the compiler cycle. So we can capture whenever you're calling a constructor or something that is unsafe as we will see in a little bit. Here's another example. Uh, this API, because we are using the free key, we cannot do more than a couple of requests in parallel. So here we're yet adding another predicate. <clears throat> and in this predicate, we are constraining that 
the only range of value has to be one or two, which is what we can use uh, in the free API. So we are using the enhanced type max request, which is an inline class and has potentially minimal cost. For most cases, one box. For some others, it will have to, but uh, it still gives us a super lean uh, runtime, which is verified and checked at compile time. And finally, here's another example uh, showing the powerful uh, things of this API. Here, we're not just using the standard library, but a full-blown uh, mastodontic regular expression that we have deemed appropriate as what a URL means to us, because we didn't want to use the Java net URL constructor since it's uh, side effecting and blows up on, on, form, on invalid URLs. So we are instead at compile time verifying construction of these URLs of the configuration. They're always correct and nobody is actually uh, passing in the, in the wrong way. So <clears throat> when a refine type uh, fails to, to run, uh, there can be many reasons why this happened. One of the reasons might be because the value is uh, out of range. And sometimes we just may not be able to check that the value is out of range at compile time because instead of being a constant value, it might be referring to a dynamic value that comes from a database and endpoints or who knows, right? So in this case, refine types give you also a runtime uh, API. And this runtime API uh, ensures that whenever you take a runtime value, you always get back a nullable type uh, so you get null if invalid or the value if valid. And you also have access to all the predicates in the map to perform manual validation uh, yourself and store any of the predicates uh, or show them where, however you want. There seems to be another question. Um, are there any limitations to what kind of refinements can be done? From what I understand, you basically need to validate, analyze the restrictions at compile time. Now, <clears throat> there is two, uh, two approaches. It's a hybrid approach. There is the compile time constant evaluator approach, which is the one that works over constant. And there is another one, which is a parallel profit process for data flow analysis over the Kotlin code, which is able to logically determine uh, the data flow that you carry based on expression refinements that may come from uh, remote values or from uh, rules such as is it OK to access the head of a list? Well, yes, if you check for it's empty. So this kind of information we carry through and we can apply into our refinement. So we can, whenever you've checked for a refined expression, then we can essentially do what Kotlin does with nullable types and with Booleans. We can smart cast the value. So that value is known from their own uh, to have such, such properties of the refinement. So here's an example where we have uh, all of these different refinements we were using earlier. And we see the racer key, it's bigger than it should have been. Uh, and the racer key now, if we fix it, then it compiles fine. We see another problem with the max request, we are exceeding the limit. So we can change it to two. And saying here, one of the analysis URL was malformed, then we should probably uh, fix that and then it did all compile. Uh, that's fine. So this uh, essentially proves that you can constrain the construction uh, of objects based on type refinements that help you model types in a much more advanced and better way than using int a string to the model IDs and, and things that are probably in a much constrained range than the, the types that most of us uh, use from the standard library. There is another question. Can constructor of these inline classes be made private so validation always happen? <clears throat> yes, those constructors can be made private. So currently, you can actually do that because uh, just for public knowledge, uh, you can suppress any warning in Kotlin. So if you get an error for having a private constructor in the class, you can suppress that warning and test if in use case is going to work or not. There might be use cases where that might blow up. <laughs> If someone is checking the visibility of that for any purpose, 
but in whatever case, those can be made uh, private. Also, type refinements are not bound to inline classes. This means you can refine regular classes as well. So for those cases where perhaps an inline class is not really a good choice, for example, if you're using generics, it's not going to give you much of a, an abstraction because it's going to be boxing most of the time anyway. So in those cases, you can just use regular uh, classes. OK, so this covers uh, type refinements. And the next thing we're going to be talking about is about uh, given, implicit, and how we have implemented those in Kotlin and how these differ from the ones uh, in Scala. So we've implemented a, a version of uh, given implicit resolution, which this implies is that you can have a function and this function may have an arbitrary number of uh, implicit declared arguments. In this case, the argument A is implicitly declared and the compiler, instead of asking the user to provide it, will try to find a coherent value in the global scope that satisfies the function. This means that you can uh, essentially call the function just providing the argument B and the compiler can automatically find A for you and will allow you to write more succinct uh, DSLs and less uh, boilerplate. So as always, when we provide a mechanism for the compiler to figure out something, uh, we also provide a way for users to manually overwrite it if they wish to. And in this case, uh, for any of these uh, given implicits that the compiler finds, you can always, as a user, pass an explicit argument in which case the compiler will accept your explicit argument and not perform any resolution finding uh, the coherent value in the environment. What this implies uh, as a feature is that this is effectively uh, a dependency injection. And this dependency injection that supports as a provider styles, uh, classes, values, uh, objects, top level, functions, uh, and so on and not only supports all of those uh, declarations of Kotlin as providers for the value of your coherent type, but it also does not require constructor or setter or any kind of injection at the declaration level. It works at the expression level, which means that you can implicitly summon any of these coherent uh, values wherever you want. Additionally, if uh, you are <coughs> familiar with uh, perhaps other languages or frameworks, you'll notice uh, this word coherence. So what this basically means is that if someone is the owner of the type A or B or any type, we want those people to be the ones uh, publishing the information for those types in the, in the ecosystem, because they might be the one that are adding the extensions and those will have prevalence over the ones uh, that you have locally. But as a user, you can always provide an implicit internal override. This allows you in testing to change the behavior of remote libraries that provide uh, providers and still not being able to export it so that they don't become ambiguous when other people mix your libraries in the ecosystem. So all of these internal overrides that you provide for third party libraries, you can use in your local modules, but you won't be able uh, to export yourself. Uh, for others to consume. For all the data types you create, then you will be able to explore for others to consume, and those will be the ones chosen for the compiler when we resolve the values. And here's a couple of examples of that. We have uh, an object, the, the racer config, and this object is uh, uh, has the given annotation. The given annotation is basically flagging this function as a provider for the type racer config and it's going to give us a value that we want in our application based on two other uh, values and as you've noticed here those two other values are also flagged as given with the given function as i mentioned earlier in any position expression whether it's value arguments or inside method bodies you can summon these types uh, coherently and here, what we are seeing is that the entire racer config will actually become materialized automatically if we also provide 
given key and given max parallel requires as types. And then we can also see that not only just uh, those simple configuration files, but other more complex files, like in this case, it's a full-blown implementation service. We are here stating that this class provider is the provider for the NLP service. So anytime anyone wants the NLP service, as we're going to see in a second, they can just summon this value, and the compiler will find <clears throat> the Razor NLP service and inject it automatically in your program. We can see here one of the final features, and these are coercion functions. Coercion functions are extremely powerful because what they do is like they shorten the path between two types, but make it invisible. In this case, we are here uh, hiding the entire complexity of our application and implementation and services in a simple API that users can consume. This says, if I have a list of analysis URLs, I have a direct coercion to an NLP remote error or set of entities, which is what this API returns. And we can do it by injecting the NLP service and then just fetching the entities. This results in users, uh, as you see in the bottom, we have now the key and the max parallel requests as providers for our program. And then we have entities still called explicitly we see that it returns a union. But we can see also that when we make entities implicit, which is one of the recommendations, then the API courses automatically hiding the entire complexity of the program. So these are the same as extension functions as we saw earlier where we project members. But in, in this case, we also uh, project subtypes. So to finalize, I'm going to show you a small, very quick table that shows uh, the theory behind some of these concepts and what we how we will be able to, to build this uh, in Kotlin. So as we saw earlier, there is a direct relationship between logic type theory, category theory, and something like the Kotlin type system or a language like Kotlin. And we can see here that these relationships allows us to uh, find what Kotlin or these languages have associated on each case. And in this case, we see here that implication is associated to Kotlin in terms of extension, meaning a type extends another. But we also see in the query hover correspondence that this implication can be represented as a function from this type to the other type. And this is what all these proofs you're seeing with given coercion, refinement, and all those do. They defi define a bridge function between a type to another, so you can safely at compile time make that gap. And it's able to validate and cooperate with the Kotlin type checker so that your programs in Kotlin are 100% compatible without any changes, but you can still use these advanced features and the code you generate is also compatible downstream without your users having to use uh, the features. And <clears throat> that's uh, all I have uh, for today. Uh, I think I have one more question. Uh, let me see. Ivan is asking, only the owner can publish an implementation. A user cannot. Does this only apply to implicit usage? Can I explicitly use another user uh, implementation? Yes, you can. So essentially, you can always overcome any limitation by declaring your own internal override that points to a different or a specific implementation. For example, in the event that someone will trick the system and will compile two binaries with colliding or ambiguous uh, instances that will collide because, for example, uh, two different libraries bring the syntax for a string that uh, combine or monoid in this case provided, in that case, the user is advised that there is such collision, but that's, that collision can be easily disambiguated by you just defining a new function that is internal and its implementation delegating to the one uh, that you want to take precedence. Because internal overrides always take precedence over coherent uh, global uh, instances. I hope that answers the question, Iman. Cool.
I don't know if there is uh, any other questions. Uh, have no questions, I had to compliment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All the animations in the ground help understanding the concepts. Okay, so yes, uh, I wanna say thank you, first of all, to everyone that made this presentation uh, possible. This is a, a, a joint effort of the 47 Degrees Academy and the entire marketing, marketing team and all the co-workers at 47 Degrees that are helping us catalog and put together uh, the best learning materials for functional programming and to get some of these more uh, abstract concepts uh, across uh, easily. So that is all, thank you uh, to them and, and not to me and this, uh, the delivery of this message. And also I wanna say that the work that you've seen on the type system, while I have been working um, the major of my time on it, it's also been the work of many others in the Aero Meta uh, team uh, too many to mention, but it's not just uh, uh, my work. So thank you so much for the compliment.